the state was very hostile when I grew up. It was illegal for teachers to talk positively about homosexuality in schools. Wow. It was illegal for any local authority to talk positively about homosexuality in terms of public health and health provision. And so it didn't promote safe and stable relationships, safe and stable um, mental health, because it treated you as if you were wrong and you needed to be condemned. And the law, in fact, said that when local authorities and teachers mentioned it, they had to talk about it in a negative way. Uh, and that has changed, that changed dramatically with the abolishing of Section 28. Um, but things can easily reverse. Section 28 only lasted about 15 years, from the 80s to the late 90s. Thankfully, politically, we have moved the issue on to a stage now where there's no one in Parliament or no one significant in Parliament saying that we should really listen to those parents protesting. And most people say that we should insist that these issues are taught. These are issues about safety. Uh, these are issues about understanding who you are, understanding your own sexuality. And yes, these things need to be raised at the very youngest of ages. Mm -hmm. Of course, appropriately. But you need to understand at the very youngest of age, is it appropriate to touch friends and no, absolutely. in certain ways. Yeah, you have to teach that from the very youngest age to keep children safe primarily, you know, otherwise they're vulnerable to predators. And the fact that there's been a pushback because some, a very small amount of this wider material is talking about um, LGBT relationships or LGB relationships in particular is extremely worrying. Um, and so we must be vigilant, uh, uh, but things have moved on. Yeah. Things have moved on in a state that here in Parliament now, not only everyone in the Commons agrees, in the House of Lords, which kept stopping progressive legislation going through, now that wouldn't happen and these things go through straight away. Yeah. Clearly is a risk. Um, uh, and I don't think it's just right-wing populism. I think that there is a general right-wing commercialization that is also uh, mm -hmm. very dangerous. And you see it in health settings where people, groups of people are pitted against each other. So we talk about the rollout here in Britain of PrEP. Yes. It's costly, uh, but in the end it will save money. Of course and in the end, it will save lives. And we know, because we're limiting the numbers at the moment in the UK, we know there are people that have contracted HIV that asked for PrEP originally and would have avoided that, uh, that path. But how the government phrases it, or how some people phrase it, is, well, do you want to treat someone with cancer or do you want to support someone living a promiscuous lifestyle? Mm. Well, they're dangerous currents because you start pitting people against each other. Exactly. I mean, you could then say, well, we shouldn't treat people with cancer if they've smoked. We shouldn't treat people with cancer if they've lived an unhealthy lifestyle. Yeah. Look, people live lifestyles. People live how they live. You should treat them as they come and try and reduce harm and reduce costs and uh, prevent diseases at an early stage. But there's are many ways of doing that. But what you see is this pitting against each other, which kind of moralizes and it says there are some kind of things that you do that are um, immoral and there are other things that you do that are moral. Now, no one says to women, you can't have the morning after pill or not the, 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 yeah. the, the contraceptive pill because it might make you more promiscuous. Oh, well, people did 30 years ago say that, but we've moved on. And we now need to think about how we move on on some of those discussions on LGBT. And that's why HIV is quite interesting, because whilst it isn't wrapped up only to the LGBT community, the stigmas that are sometimes associated yeah. with it are. And that's why also you see some of this reluctance in terms of health policy. Well, I think we've got two issues um, in the UK. One is around some of that rollout of PrEP, mm -hmm. that treatment to prevent. And 
the delays of the government doing it is all about moralisation. So they kind of are worried that people will sleep around more if they're on on this. So they prefer people to live in a state of fear than in a state yeah. of liberation. That's a real problem. And that's a pinch point in terms of not only, as I mentioned before, costs, but actually in terms of getting people's head around what the NHS should provide. Um, but we know where it has been rolled out. Infection rates are really reduced. And we are now seriously starting to be able to talk about getting to very single figure numbers of new diagnoses in maybe 30 years, or even less, 20 years time. So some of this is really positive. But we can't make any move on that unless we do really roll out treatment to prevent. Then, of course, the silver bullet of a lot of these things would be some sort of vaccine, some sort of cure, some sort of, and I'm not particularly fussy about whether it's a vaccine or whether it's just an absolute cure or, or whatever, but clearly there needs to be a final push on some of that. And then the third final thing is around stigma, um, because a lot of the associated comorbidities with HIV are actually linked to stigma. It's about people feeling that they can't access certain things, it's about people being excluded from certain things. And so stigma campaigns that are starting all around the world now are so important to start uh, to turn this around. Because let us remember, in the 1980s in Britain and other parts of the world as well, the campaign was all about fear. Yeah. It was about, in Britain they had huge tombstones, AIDS, you know, kind of don't die of ignorance and boom and scared the heck out of a lot it's of people. It's kind of stayed in our collective memory yeah. as well. Yeah. You know? And possibly, you could argue, at that time, it was the right choice to do. You didn't have any other tools in their toolbox. They didn't have drugs. They didn't have... So you had to just try and make people aware. But the damage that that has done, even though it was the right choice at that time, in the longer, as you say, collective, in the collective memory, means that we now need to do a hard-hitting set of campaigns around destigmatizing this, about making people understand. And generally, I would say, generally, I have a very positive reaction from people, particularly when I talk about myself being undetectable, meaning untransmittable. And people in certain communities are starting to get that. Well, I, I, I think some people think that it's already in the bag. Some people think it's that maybe it's yeah. already going to come and mm -hmm. why I'd need to throw more money at it. Well, developing the, a vaccine or a cure is only the first step. Then you've got to get it out to the people. And so plowing the money in at the end is, is actually really important to make sure it becomes applicable because we can find something in theory, but we then have to develop it in practice. And that requires a lot of resources and money. And if we don't get that right, then we will have done all the thinking, but none of the action. Well, there needs to be still remaining money in terms of awareness campaigns, awareness around stigma and awareness around feeling feeling comfortable in your own sexuality, in your own being. I don't mean in your sexuality, whether you're gay or bisexual, although that's part of it, but in your own ability to be able to feel comfortable in who you are. Because if you don't, you're more likely to take risks. You're more likely to do things that are not informed. You're more likely to do things that are dangerous. And um, so those are the areas that we need to really focus on. Some of the, the prep work, some of the treatment to, to prevent, and some of the areas in terms of uh, awareness. Three, there were three kind of reasons. I was a relatively new MP, and to some extent, it is easier to do it when you're newer than leave it hanging on you. you know, and I'm as, I was aware, the more years I left, the harder it would be for me. You know, sometimes it's better just to get these things out. Two, we were really at a crux point with some of the prep rollout. Still, the government is delaying. And, I, uh, and at the same time, the government has cut millions from sexual health 
provision here in the UK. We've got a growing sexual health e epidemic. And I thought it was an important political moment. Um, and uh, I also felt like it was a milestone in terms of my own personal journey. And I wanted to be able to have a weight off my shoulders. And it is a weight off your shoulders, actually. To, I, I don't, no one needs to go around shouting about it. But I tell anyone that's not um, out or open or relaxed about their status, it's just so much better and easier to Absolutely, be yeah. to be happy sense. about it and to not, you know, then you, it comes up in conversation naturally, whereas before, whenever it kind of comes up, your mind is always swirling, shall I say now, shall I not say now? And it inhibits just Absolutely. kind of who you are. So, so actually, that was also another reason, because yeah. it's important just to be who you are. Well, I made the decision a few months before, mm -hmm. and I had spoken to the national um, uh, organisations, such as the Terence Egan's Trust, um, the Beaver, which is the British HIV Association, um, and those other organisations that are, exist in the UK. And I said, this is my intention. Would you help me? And they had helped me. Um, and to some extent, once I'd made the decision, it was all easy flowing until, of course, a few days before, and then your nerves do start to get the better <laughs> of you. You start to wonder if oh, you've done the right thing. Mm. Um, and I had just recently started a new relationship, um, and my partner um, uh, was positive as well. Uh, but I hadn't told him that I was going to do it. So the first time he found out was when it was oh, on wow. the TV, um, and we didn't really speak about it. He just said, what you did there was very good, thank you. So that was nice afterwards. Um, but I felt like if I told people too much, then I would get more nervous. So I felt like I just had to get on with it. And the moment before the leader of my party came over and wished me luck, and that was the moment I started to feel a bit jittery. You know, it was real. The lips started wavering, but you got through it. And uh, as I said, it is a relief. And the political point is also made that we need to not take our foot off the gas before we get to the finish line. It's not a taboo topic, that would be wrong to say. It is one of many topics that people are having to think about and talk about, and most members don't think about it day to day. Um, and there are, of course, some of the detail areas that people don't really end up going into. I'm not sure if it, that is taboo or if that is just that people don't know. When I first had to talk about undetectable um, means untransmittable, there were lots of members here in the parliament that said, oh, really? We didn't know that. And so we, had to, we had to go through it. And when writing my speech, I had to rewrite it a bit because the speech, you know, you, I write the speech and then it goes to the speech writers in the party and in the parliament, they make sure it, and they just said, you need to rewrite it. You need to repeat this undetectable means unequal, uh, un untransmittable, um, uh, that, that you're on effective treatment. And you need to repeat that three or four times. So the message is- He said, because right. unless you do that, the message is not gonna get across um, because people won't believe it the first time because it so sounds stubborn resistance well somehow. because it sounds so unbelievable. Whereas before, many people in this parliament, mm. in their fifties and sixties, they f were raising their families in a period when it was a death sentence, and to suddenly turn around and say everything you knew is different now, um, that it's no longer a death sentence, that actually you can live a relatively normal life, that you you can't pass it on sexually if you're on effective treatment, all those kinds of things is a real learning point for people. And so that has taken a bit longer for people to get their head around, but I think they have. In one sense, I hope lots of other people do follow in my footsteps. And in another sense, I hope that it starts to turn a a tide where people don't have to follow in my footsteps, you know, kind of, so it's a contradictory kind of feeling. I think that we need a few more people to normalize it, to come out, as it were, with their status. But actually where we want to get to, and we, I think in some quarters you can get there quite quickly, 
now the LGBT community actually, in some parts of the LGBT community, I think we are getting very close yeah. uh, to be there, where actually it becomes something that is normalized, you know, kind of, okay, you're on treatment, you're on, it's all okay, fantastic, let's move on. There's no real discussion about it. That's where we want to get for everyone. But in large swathes of the community, in more rural areas, in areas where religion predominates, even here in Britain, there is still a real stigma that people are petrified. And there are people working in this place, researchers, um, for MPs that I know who are positive, who still fear about telling their families back at home. So that's even in Britain. I think you, we all deal with a bit of self-stigma and that's often the thing that holds us back. It's often the thing that holds us back talking about it. It's often the thing that holds us back from acting in kind of a sensible and rational kind of ways in, in some respects. And if I go to the, um, the Lunch Positive Club on Fridays in my constituency where um, HIV positive people will have lunch all together and there's about sometimes 20 people, sometimes 100 people will turn wow. up. Um, if you speak to them, a lot of the issues is around self-stigma, around a difficulty about feeling that you can do things uh, now and you don't have to self-censor uh, yourself. And that is one of the things that we need to change because adherence to medication, adherence to um, living a positive outlook, as you put it, yeah. actually suddenly can make your life completely different. Completely different, yeah. Well, if you're still discriminating against people, if you're still fearful about HIV, then I would say just, it is not helpful for anyone. It is not helpful for you to have a fear around people with HIV because they can't harm you. And actually the best way of controlling and um, uh, HIV is to be open about it, is to encourage people to take effective treatment, to not hide about it. And that is how you will keep you and your family safe if that's what you're afraid of. And if you're afraid for other reasons, well then probably just get over yourself, you know, kind of. Um, and for people who are living with HIV, um, if you're not out about it, I would say, and you can disclose to people safely, I would say do it, it is uh, much, uh, is, is good, it's good to do. It is good for your self-esteem, it is good for your person. And if you can't, then I would say know that there are hundreds and thousands of other men and women out there who are in a similar situation to you and that you will survive, you will get on if you think positively and if you take um, the right courses of action you will live as healthily and happily and you can be anything you want to be. Lloyd, thank you very much. For